you come here? Yes, yes we are. Okay. Hi. Hi. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry. All right. So. Um, I'm going to speak for a little bit and then there'll be like question and answers and um, kind of discussion if you guys want to do that. Um, so first off, I'm 23. I'm an undergraduate student here at U of BC. I'm a gender and women's studies major and a minor in biological sciences. Um, I um, go to school full time and everything, but uh, I only have classes three days a week. So other than that, like I knit, I watch a lot of Netflix, hang out with my dog, falafel. <laughs> She's the best. Um, I also have a part-time job, um, and that's pretty much as normal as I get. And then um, my job is kind of changes things up a bit. Um, kind of to put it bluntly, I take my clothes off for money. Um, I work as a stripper. Uh, I've been doing it for two and a half years now, um, and it puts me under the category of sex worker. It's kind of like when I think of the range of sex workers, I'm like somewhere in the middle between like doing things online and trading the sex for money. Um, so, I also am um, a queer anti-racist feminist. I'm queer, um, I like an emphasis on intersectionality in a lot of my feminism. And I'm trying to bring that together with like queer theory and feminist theory and my own firsthand experiences to kind of get into this conversation. And just as a disclaimer, I'm not trying to be representative of sex work as a whole is really a wide range. I'm just trying to use the immense privilege I receive to kind of open up a conversation that will hopefully, like, hopefully start a bunch of activism and things within this field. Um, all right, so to start out, I want to do a couple of definitions. The first is sex work as a whole. I really like this definition from Robert Richardson, which is that the term sex work encompasses a wide range of activities, both legal and illegal. Um, they include the trading of some form of sexual activity, performance, or fantasy for some kind of payment. And it's really vague and open, and that's what I like about it. Um, especially with the internet, a lot more people have been able to actually engage in sex work in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different bodies and getting involved because you have a lot wider of an audience you can appeal to. Um, and then the other one I use a lot is going to be survival sex, and it's trading sex for either money or a place to stay. This is mostly used when talking about homeless LGBT people, or homeless people in general. Um, and then consent, which is less of a definition and more of just a clarification. Um, so sex work is consensual, and that's a really important distinction to make because sex work is often lumped in with human trafficking when people are arguing against it, and um, human trafficking is not consensual. And I want to like emphasize that if you legalize sex work, you're not legalizing human trafficking at all. That thing will overlap. Um, yeah, so why is this a queer issue? Um, to start off with that, it kind of just starts in history. I like to do that. So um, Fatih P. Shaw has this quote that sex work has always been relevant to queer and trans communities, both as a livelihood option and as an issue that critically informs the space between social and political margins and the sexualities of queer and trans communities. Um, I like that a lot because it's like, it affects our community in just a wide range of ways, um, especially since queer and trans communities are so heavily talked about in terms of like sex and sexuality and sex trade is very similar to that. Um, and then the Stonewall riots, a lot of people have probably heard about that. It's like, within New York City in 1969, it's often discussed as, um, the birthplace of the gay rights movement. And so the gay rights movement now and kind of shortly after that became known as like this white middle class, often homosexual male, cisgendered body, that that's the face of it. Like if you look at any human rights campaign or organization pictures, it's all conventionally attractive, mostly white middle class individuals. But the Stonewall riots were started by the transgender people involved, uh, drag queens were big, um, sex workers and queer people of color kind of the already marginalized people. So yeah, that's that's what who's taking the brunt of all of the harassment and discrimination. And um, they were tired of it, so they started fighting back against the cops. And then kind of after that, um, there was a lot of queer activism. Um, so there was all in that kind of time span. There's like the civil rights, black power movements, 
the second wave of feminism and then the gay rights movement, all of which had just huge movements and anyone that wanted to get involved and be these radical activists kind of had a hard time finding work that allowed it because activism didn't pay well unless you were a main figurehead you weren't really given livable wages so a lot of people would do activism and sex work because it offered flexible hours good wages if you get locked up you don't lose your job and that happened often if you get hurt if something happens to you health-wise like you're not getting your job lost, and that sucks a lot. And so basically, people were selling their bodies so that we could enjoy all the rights we have today. So you have all these queer people in the 70s and 80s selling their bodies so today that we could have marriage equality in so many states. And you have so many people now continuing to sell their bodies because the mainstream movement kind of prioritized gay marriage and marriage equality over poverty and racism and transphobia and all the issues that are continuing to be an issue now and causing people to sell their bodies, which kind of moved into like, how is this relevant today? Who is doing this today? And who's kind of doing this more than other groups? So yeah, everyone on some level of race, class, gender, et cetera, is doing sex work on some kind of range of activities. Um, but to talk about who's doing it disproportionately higher and who's suffering from it, we start with like transgender people. Um, it's just generally transgender people looking to physically transition. Um, they often lack access to healthcare, access to insurance, and transgender people often lack a lot of support um, and from their families financially and everything. So sex work becomes a very real option for them to make money and to afford hormones, surgery, or even a place to live. Um, homeless LGBT youth and LGBT people lacking support from their families, it kind of goes in together because a lot of people that lack support end up being homeless. Um, that's a big issue um, that is often not really seen and it's pretty invisible in our community and it's a growing community. And then the last is LGBT people from working class families. So people that were just born into poverty, um, and don't have the kind of educational and financial backgrounds to find a livable wage in America, they often supplement with sex work as a way to kind of get out of poverty and transcend class. Um, I wanna get into two of these groups specifically and some uh, statistics on it. The first being homeless queer youth. Um, so this kind of goes over some of the main issues that I want to talk about. So 5% of the youth population overall identifies as LGBT. But in the homeless youth population, that's about an estimated 40%. Some say that it's probably higher because a lot of homeless people don't disclose that information. Um, and in numbers, this is somewhere between 32, or 320,000 and 400,000 homeless LGBT youth in the US alone. Um, one in four overall homeless youth are either a victim of trafficking or engaging in survival sex is becoming higher. When we're talking about LGBT homeless youth who are three times more likely to engage in survival sex um, than their non-queer counterparts. Um, so this is mostly contributed to the average uh, age of coming out dropping so much over the past like 10 years. So in 1990s, the average coming out age was around post-college, so mid to late 20s. Today's around 16, and a big part of that is like the internet. Um, people lack privacy, people are outed a lot easier. And then um, also marriage equality. Marriage equality being so prevalent in the media and television shows kind of puts out this false narrative that we've like come so much further than we actually have, and that people are a lot more accepting. So people are coming out voluntarily a lot younger. And at 16, almost everyone is completely financially dependent upon their parents. So when they leave, there aren't a lot of LGBT specific homeless centers. So if you can't get to a city, you're often left dealing with just regular youth centers and they face a lot of discrimination, a lot of violence. Survival sex is more often than not used for a place to stay instead of money. Um, I think that kind of still falls under sex trade because it is an exchange for something. Um, people move from partner to partner in order to just have a place to sleep. So to keep it, on that, there's the 
trans women specifically, because that's who we often think of when we think transgender sex workers, is often trans women. Um, I like to think that we're only as progressed as our most oppressed individual, and in our community, I think there's black trans women. Um, transgender women of all races face a lot of violence in higher proportions, a lot of suicide, but um, it gets even worse when you're a trans woman of color, and it gets even worse when you're a black trans woman. BlackLivesMatter.com reports the average life expectancy of a black trans woman is only 35. Um, that would give me about 10 more years to live, and that's terrifying. So, a lot of these women are engaging in sex work. Um, they're dying all the time. I think there's been, I did a quick Google search and I found seven trans women that have been murdered in 2016 alone, um, which is terrifying. And it's underreported often because of misgendering and just because people aren't talking about it. And these aren't even including the people that are killing themselves. I know that when, there was the one trans woman who was 17, Layla Al Alcorn, yeah, who killed herself. And then more recently, the 18 year old black trans man who was Blake Brockington and he was involved in activism. You know, it's not, his family wasn't supportive, but he was still involved in his community. He did still have a support system, but it's still not enough for a lot of trans people. Uh, so the, there are the ones that are out there doing sex work. And in Chicago, the Young Women's Empowerment Project found that police were cited as the number one force, like source of violence and abuse. This is coming even higher for transgender people that found that almost a third experienced harassment and disrespect from the police, which obviously gets a lot higher when you talk about transgender people of color. Um, Another thing that I found out that was really awful, which is, um, so in the history of queer history and everything, there's been uh, a lot of police abuse where they misuse laws or make laws in order to jail and um, harass gay men and drag queens. In fact, that's the whole Stonewall thing. And I want to point out that this is it's still happening today with trans women and sex trade laws. There's laws that were um, introduced that were meant to jail clients over sex workers, and they're all felonies, and they're all prostitution charges, and trans women are much more likely to face these charges, and then they're generally stripped of their identities in jail, they're booked under their, they're classified as male, put down under their birth name, and then they post their mugshots online in an effort to um, shame the men buying sex from them, which has never been proven effective as anything other than just traumatizing these women further. and there's no laws against doing that because they're seen as felons now, so they lose a lot of their own rights. Okay, so to kind of take a break from how awful and depressing that is, I want to talk about myself a little bit. Um, so about two and a half years ago, I was balancing school and some recent health issues that I was trying to get over, and I wanted a part-time job. But I knew that getting a part-time job could derail my education or derail my health, and. In the end, it was my health that derailed my education and my job really only prolonged my ability to work in either of those. Um, so I needed, or I was living with my ex-partner at the time, and still, who is here, and my partner was recently graduated and working in a nonprofit and she was not making much money. She was like a paid intern. Um, so money was tight and basically the job I was looking for had flexible hours low hours, breaks whenever I needed them, and a lot of money. So I pretty much was <laughs> limited in my options to what I thought was nothing. Um, and the actually key influence that got me involved, like I'd been going to strip clubs since I turned 18. I knew about them, I liked them, but a couple women that I knew at UMBC were talking about it. They were like, you know, I've been doing this, some other forms of sex work, um, and I was like, you know, hey, you know, she can do it. I can, I can do that, yeah. Like, and then they talked about the money, and I was like, yeah, I could definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was that was interesting. But then I did a lot of research online. Like, I'm a huge nerd. I was originally a bio major, so like, I did research. I talked extensively with everyone I knew doing it. Um, I talked to my partner, my friends. My therapist, not my parents at the time, but that came later. Um, and I, you know, I kind of figured there's no real risk in trying it. It's not one of those jobs where once you start, you have to get notice if you quit. You just stop showing up. They don't question it. So I was like, you know, I'll go. I knew that if I didn't like it, I already didn't have a job, so I could always just 
quit, reassess my situation, and then proceed forward. Um, I ended up staying and I took some breaks and everything, but I ended up keep coming back because I did like the job quite a bit. Um, the work itself I enjoyed, which is kind of weird and hard to explain to a lot of people. But I also made my own schedule. I could alter it at the last minute if my health or course load was too much. Um, I was able to eat healthy, which is very expensive. Exercise frequently. The work itself, like I do a lot of pull trips, so it, it is a lot of exercise on its own. I also could afford a nice gym and everything, so I was constantly, I was in the best shape of my life when I first started. I feel all right. I work, health, or I go to class a lot now though. But yeah, I was, I was really healthy. Um, it gave me time to get involved. Uh, I was the vice president of Freedom Alliance here at UMBC. I also was doing volunteer work in Baltimore City. And I had these options. I could go to school, I could volunteer, I could get involved because I was only working two or three nights a week and making much more than I needed. And that's another thing is the money doesn't compare to anything else I'm qualified for right now. Even like if I worked full time in another job and compared that to a couple times, it's it's still so much more doing what I do and there's really nothing that can beat that. Like I think we kind of have this idea that in your twenties you're supposed to be worried about money constantly and I think it's really stressful and unnecessary and not having that in my life makes it so I can succeed in other realms so much easier and that's really important to me because school's not cheap. Um, so kind of to talk more about my experiences and to talk about the ways in which they're shaped by intersectionality and also some of the ways in which other things can shape other women or other people's um, experiences. I want to go into this kind of analysis on it. So I'm really fun where I like to talk about race all the time and how racism is still a thing and my family on Facebook really loves it. <laughs> so that's where I'm going to start because I think that's super important. Um, if you haven't noticed, I'm white. And that's the thing I'm like, I read as female. So my sexuality is kind of this more innocent thing. Um, I'm like more perceived as like this virginal innocent human being. White women are soccer moms and wives. Um, when I tell people what I do at school, they're like, you're so brave, you're so empowering. It's like this righteous feminist act of reclaiming your body and sexuality. It's not. I am very clear that what I'm doing is just a job. Like in certain aspects, I do feel like I am empowered in it, but I don't think I'm changing anything for anyone by doing what I do. Um, when I take off my clothes, it's just a part of my job. I'm just doing a thing. It's not, it's not a big deal. But this isn't true for my black or Hispanic or Asian counterparts, where their bodies are kind of already eroticized. We have like coded words like exotic, um, the yellow fever. And um, so yeah, it's kind of like they're already just reinforcing stereotypes. Where I'm kind of praised, they're seen as a traitor. The act of engaging in sex work becomes justification for the stereotypes and discrimination used against them. A lot of people within their own community have trouble with it. They see it as it, like it's fighting against what a lot of future generations fought so hard to achieve. Um, and I think that's like really hard for a lot of people. They choose generally not to disclose what they do or just kind of not get involved with a lot of other things. Um, I also think you can't talk about race without talking about class. So I'm really middle class. I grew up in Bethesda, Maryland. I grew up about 10 minutes from one of the richest neighborhoods in the entire country. And I went to public schools that were all nationally ranked. Um, what this kind of means is that like my family knows what I do and everything. Uh, they're not really approving, but they're a lot more supportive than I could have ever hoped for. And I love them for that. And, um, but I know that if for any reason I no longer wanted to do this, I can fall back on them. They've told me multiple times, like, if this is not what you want to do, and they've done it in the past, I can quit. They'll take care of me financially while I transition. If I get another job that doesn't pay as well, they'll supplement me with that. Um, I decided to work less to focus more on school. They helped support me with my rent and everything. Um, it's just phenomenal. And it's something that's not a reality for people that are lower classes than I am. When you don't have that background, even if your family is 100% emotionally supportive of what you do, they can't help you get out of it. You know, it's really hard for a lot of the women I work with to transition out of this. To go from a job where you have flexibility and you have money and you can reliant on that to go to working minimum wage jobs and a lot of these women didn't graduate high school or they have GEDs and they don't have options for school 
and everything, so they can kind of work minimum wage. And if you're used to making a lot more than minimum wage, it's very difficult to transition back to that. It also means that they can get out of poverty. It's a lot of the ways in which they pay for school or they supplement it with other income. Um, and it's just, it's a completely different experience for them. I think kind of the weirdest way, I was talking to my mother about this recently that I experienced privilege is with my queer privilege. Um, I already have a preference for kind of non-heterosexual partners and a lot of my relationships aren't really normative in their structure. So generally the people I date are not the people that have issues with it. Like regardless of what I'm doing, the people that don't want to date strippers are not generally the people I'm interested in. So my dating life has been relatively unaltered. Um, I have never had trouble getting dates or relationships or people interested in me since I started working. I think I had more trouble beforehand because I was awkward. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm still awkward, but I also can afford to dress nicer, and like that does help. So <laughs> that definitely helps me. Um, the other thing is gender identity, which is like a really hard thing for me to conceptualize in words. I've talked about how transgender people face a lot more violence, especially when mixed with sex work. Um, cisgender people, to my knowledge are not getting discriminated on that basis in sex work. Like they're getting discriminated, but not for being cisgender. Um, I identify as like gender queer or non-binary, and that's really hard for me because I have to commit to presenting an over-exaggerated female appearance at least twice a week. So I can't really do much in terms of changing my appearance. I can't cut my hair, dye it purple, or <laughs> do anything kind of extreme or anything because I still have to do this, and it's, I'm also very concerned that if I start dressing androgynous and everything and getting really attached to that, it'll make me feel a lot more uncomfortable about getting really feminine a couple times a week. So yeah, that's, that's a different thing that I'm still exploring. Um, and then in the sake of time, I'm gonna kind of gloss over body. Um, I was assigned female at birth. I am able-bodied, I am thin, and I am, my opinion and a lot of people's opinions, I guess, conventionally attractive. Um, that means that I can pretty much choose from any type of sex work that I want and that my earning potential is a lot higher for anyone that those change from. Like just, you know, if you're disabled, you can't strip in most cases. It's a lot harder to get on stage and do tricks and I'm able-bodied and I walk in seven inch heels and it is terrifying. And <laughs> Like, just that alone, being in the body I am is hard. Um, thin is also a huge one. I work with women of different sizes and different looks. Um, the bigger women just don't get the same attention. If you've had children, you don't have the same attention because your body changes. Um, the conventionally attractive thing, again, is the big thing. And then the female bodied one, I think, is really important because it's like trans women can't do the work I do. There's not really a market for that. They won't get hired. Um, they are mostly pushed into sex trades. And men, there's not really a huge thing for male strippers either. I was talking about this, I was like, there's not a lot of clubs, it's more something that needs to be higher for parties. Um, so yeah, I could basically do anything and earn whatever I want because of the way I look and the body I was born in. So that's like immense privilege, I can do it as safe as I want to. I wanna say that I am very safe in what I do, um, not just for my mom's sake, but I am actually safe and I never have to worry about that. Um, and I also get treated very well because they don't want me to leave. I have a lot of job security and that they're trying to let me do whatever I want because I am on a different tier than a lot of the women that I work with. And then the last thing I wanna go over is my education level and how that offers a lot for me. So sex work becomes something that is very clearly temporary for me. It's something I'm doing while I'm in school till I get the career that I want. And because I'm in college and I'm middle class and I have support, I can major in whatever I want, which is gender and women's studies, um, and do whatever I want and do what I love. So yeah, sex work can just be a thing until I get to the point that I love. I'm not worried about what I'm gonna do afterwards. I have that support and that background. And another thing is that being a woman in America, you kind of have this crappy thing where your self-esteem is often tied to your looks. And being in college, I have the reinforcement that my looks don't determine who I am, I determine who I am. And if you do sex work and you don't have that distinction, it can be incredibly brutal on your, your everything. Um, because your pay is determined by how you look. People judge you by your looks and people are not nice about it. Other girls 
are mean about it that you work with, customers are mean, they often think that you can't hear them, but you can, and it's hard. It's hard to be on stage and naked and hearing people say terrible things about you. Um, I definitely receive that a lot less, but it happens every single night, and it's hard. And I benefit a lot because years ago, like I think I was 15, I just decided that I had too many things to worry about and that my looks didn't matter. My looks didn't make me a good or bad person, and so I'm very, it's very easy for me to kind of separate my work from my own self-esteem. I never did even feel bad about myself. Um, I actually felt really bad about myself every time I left my job waitressing, but that was for a lot of other reasons. Because <laughs> people are not mean to you on your looks, they just tell you you're terrible. <laughs> and generally if people say I'm terrible at work, it's because I'm legitimately being terrible to them, but that's because some customers aren't that nice and I don't really feel the need to deal with that. Um, so, the next one is kind of more about feminist theory. Um, it's this question that gets asked often, is sex work empowering or enslaving? Nick Vinci quotes pretty much some of my feelings on it, so I have Dr. Richard Wagner over here saying that I propose that sex work simply is. It is and always has been a way for some people to find their way in the world. And then Kate the Admiral is, says, it is, unnatural, or it is natural for someone to look at a puzzle, one that touches on a multitude of other issues of personal beliefs, and to try and make it fit into the understandings that we have. I think this kind of sums up that like, people are constantly trying to answer this question, as if there is one truth to sex work and how it affects people, and that just simply isn't true. Everyone's experiences, reactions, feelings, reactions 10 years from now all alter so differently. And I think because of that, we can kind of conclude that there is no inherent morality to sex work. I think that outside factors are what shapes it, and that the actual work that you're doing, pulled apart from all that, just is. Like, I like that a lot. That Richard Wagner says it just simply is. Um, so, to kind of like relate this to feminist theory, it's talked a lot about in terms of how does it contribute to patriarchy and the subordination of women and all of that fun stuff. And I'm a gender women's studies major, so I've extensively heard both sides. I also am out about what I do, so people like to tell me their feelings about it constantly. Um, <laughs> I do not think that it contributes to patriarchy. I don't think it contributes to the subordination of women. I think if anything that sex work and the conditions that sex workers face are caused by patriarchy and not um, a contributing factor at all. Um,
And yeah, so I am more of a very serious sexual investment. Um, <laughs> and people treat me as such. They, I have a lot of respect and power in these like situations that I'm involved in when I interact with clients. Um, they want me to stay interested in them. My whole job is to be interesting. I cater to them, but they don't really know. They just think like, this is, I mean, it's a big lie. They know, but they just tell themselves that I'm really this person that was tailor-made to be interesting to them. So they're spending this whole time trying to keep me interested, which often involves giving me a lot of money, and um, but not being disrespectful because I also have the power to kick them out of the club or walk away. And I don't have that at a bar. At a bar, all I can do is change my entire plans and leave and go home and cry and hope I don't. Um, <laughs> so to kind of tie this back into intersectionality, some of the outside forces that do shape these experiences are racism, sexism, transphobia, the war on drugs, which is also the war on poverty. All of these things are what's shaping it, not the actual work. Um, I don't do drugs, so that one doesn't really apply to me. I'm white and pretty and all those things. So a lot of them don't shape my own experiences, but I have watched them shape other women's experiences. And another thing I want to talk about is sexual rights. I didn't so distinguish sexual rights as human rights, and it defined it as um, the right of women to freely and without coercion, violence, or discrimination make decisions concerning their own sexuality, including their sexual or reproductive health. Now, obviously, this is a conference about women, so the language reflects that, but this can be applied to any gender. Um, so, that like the ideas of sexuality, like just because you're selling your sexuality for money does not make it sexuality and it should be protected under sexual rights. I really want to emphasize that this is a human rights violation that needs addressing under that definition that we've accepted as a human rights definition, um, telling women what they can and cannot do with their bodies and then not giving them access to health care and sexual health care is all just a human rights violation. So that kind of brings it into, um, where do we go from here? So I broke down the term sex work into sex and work and to ask these questions that I kind of think are a good starting point, which is how do we create a healthy sexual environment and how do we create a healthy work environment? I also want to say that I'm kind of new to speaking about this. I'm incredibly nervous, but I also have limited knowledge. I can only kind of talk about what I've seen, what I've researched, how I feel about things. Um, so to start with the first question, which is really difficult, which is how we create a sex a healthy sexual <laughs> environment. Um, so honestly, it involves an entire reworking of American culture surrounding sex. But that's going to take a really long time. So a couple of the ideas that I had until we get there is kind of more comprehensive, inclusive, and positive sex education. Um, equality for women, which is not meaning equality for women that are white, heterosexual, cisgendered, middle class, but equality for all women, and kind of expanding on that equality for all genders and sexualities. Um, not just like, I don't like this idea that some people are talking about things like, oh, you don't have to understand it, you just have to let me do what I want to do, but that's kind of not how it's going to work. Like, to get rid of stigma, you really have to understand each other. You have to be okay with each other. Otherwise, you're still going to have these, like, harsh feelings that shape a lot of the stigma that are hurting these people. Um, and then the healthy work environment starts with legalizing sex work. I think that's the number one important thing to do in terms of sex work alone. And the other is addressing police abuse, um, which is kind of more than that. You have to address all police abuse to really address police abuse at all. So that's obviously the police abuse against sex workers, but also police abuse against sexual assault victims and police abuse against black bodies in America. They're all intertwined. All of these, like, are going to affect sex workers. All of these are going to affect black people and women and men and anyone else who gets sexually assaulted and goes to the cops. And the only way to combat this effectively is to go at it all at once. I don't think that it's indivisible. I think it's really important to kind of address everything um, together. And the last one is support networks. There aren't really many. I was researching kind of who's getting involved, who's doing what, where can I go as a sex worker, and there's really not much. Um, I think we do need like specific support networks that offer healthcare resources. Um, and in 
information about leaving, harm reduction. I think a big problem for sex workers is that they don't think that they can leave. They don't know how to do that. Um, a lot of them are told that they really just can't, so they feel stuck. And I think these support networks not only have to help women that want to, or not women, but people that want to continue working in sex work, but people that want to leave as well. Um, and kind of the gist of it. Um, I do also want to hear a lot about your own ideas on what to do um, to kind of start this conversation because it is something that we don't talk about and it is a major part of our history and our current and probably our future for a long time. So um, I also, so two of the places that I found are in Baltimore and DC doing sex work outreach. I also added a picture of Falafel as a puppy because it was a little depressing and also I'm super nervous and I like her face. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all again for kind of being here and being a part of my conversation and open it up to any questions. I know we only have a few minutes left, but anything you guys want to ask, um, kind of, you can go ahead now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Robin, my yes. brother. Yeah. Uh, how do life expectancies and suicide rates with trans women in particular differentiate between a culture in a country like ours and uh, other countries like the South Pacific in particular where it's more um, embraced? Um, I haven't done the exact research, but I'm assuming it's a lot higher um, where people can live more openly and have more resources. I don't know how violence affects me because I know that like people are still killing trans women in like Thailand and everything, um, but I imagine their suicide rates are a lot lower. And suicide rates also change across cultures because it's like less of, like people don't do it as often in other cultures. Um, so I don't know about that, but I imagine it would be a lot higher. Thirty-five is pretty low for a life expectancy anywhere in the world right now, so I think in most places it's higher. You can ask anything, yes, yeah. Uh, I think that um, anyone who engages in arts and humanities here knows that representation of sex work is a really big deal right now in terms of the work that we create and put out. I think that the Tumblr revolution has sort of changed a lot of the way that uh, young uh, LGBTQ communities have formed and how information is sort of disseminated. And I think in the same way that uh, that has happened, we need to be really vigilant about what we're putting out in regards to the media, the content that we create. Uh, so uh, part of it's just doing it casually. I mean, if you look at a lot of the social rights movements of the past like 50 years, they've sort of run simultaneously with TV representation. So if you're looking at the 1960s, you'll see Bill Cosby's first uh, show, you'll see um, Diane Carroll and Julia, which was the first sitcom featuring a black woman on TV. Uh, same with the 90s, Will and Grace, Queer as Folk, all these shows come sim simultaneously to civil rights movements. And I think that uh, if you are in the arts right now, it's really important to represent uh, trans communities and sex work communities in a way that doesn't pass moral judgment. As you said, there's nothing inherently moral about sex work, just as there isn't anything inherently, inherently moral about disease. Uh, and so by representing sex work as just a reality and not like a special episode, you know, this, whatever, uh, I think that's really important in getting people to click in and be like, oh, that's just how people survive. Uh, so uh, I'd like to lead a call to arms in that. No, I definitely think that's really important. Um, I was talking about Tumblr recently where Tumblr is really great to get information if you're sleeping in, but Tumblr is not going to put it out for you and it's not mainstream. And, like, you like a lot of the information that I've been looking at lately of reading about other women that are like specifically strippers because a lot of the women I work with aren't able to put into words a lot of their feelings and theorize it in the ways that I'm kind of looking for for this talk. Um, I did find a lot of narrative on um, Tumblr because I also think it is very important to have first-hand narrative kind of like centralizing actual stories. I think it's really important to remember when involving in any activism for a group that is not your own to just go and ask people. Ask them what do you need and what do you want. Don't think about it like, what would I need if I was a sex worker? Because you don't know. You just don't, and I think that's really important. I think that's what causes a lot of issues when like, we give aid to third world countries and everything. Kind of hand up again. Yeah. Um, so
So I was reading an article that said that more than half of sex workers aren't aware of PrEP, pre-exposure um, prophylaxis, uh, which is the drug that prevents the contraction of HIV. Um, and I was wondering if you like had any knowledge on how that would be affected, um, how that knowledge, like that spread of knowledge would be affected um, in like the provision of, um, that you discussed earlier. I mean, I think that most of these women have very little sex education in general. I think what you're saying would be great for them to know, but I think it would also be great for them to know a lot of other things, like how to use and use condoms. Um, and that telling your partner that you want to use a condom is something that you can do and you can be firm about. Um, I notice a lot of things with heterosexual women that I work with is that they're constantly getting rejected. They're constantly being told by their partners or by potential partners that they're not wanted. And a lot of that causes this cycle of kind of cutting down their self-esteem where a lot of them end up in unhealthy relationships and abusive relationships. And a lot of them, because you know these men don't want to use condoms, a lot of them end up pregnant. A lot of the women I work with have children. It's very odd that I don't. So I think kind of giving them that education, just a basic education is really important. Because even the ones that did go to high school didn't go often or didn't graduate or didn't get a lot out of it. I had sex education in high school in the 10th grade and I wasn't a virgin anymore and it didn't help me and we talked mostly about anorexia and I'm, I didn't have that issue. And you know, I think that it starts with the more basic stuff. Like I honestly don't think that half of the women know or half of the sex workers know that there is that prep out there because that's a really high percentage in my mind based on what I know that they know about. So I think it's like I know about things. I have a gynecologist and I have good health care, thanks mom. Um, <laughs> so I don't have those issues. It is kind of like a privileged thing. And I don't trade sex so my percentage can uh, is there any methods or discussion in the queer community about sort of like basically vigilante sex education? Like, have you ever tried just like? Um, so, sex workers are not this fun, happy community. No. Um, the women I work with, like, I'm friends with everyone I work with. Like, they like me. We don't like hang out outside or anything, but I get along with everyone. Um, but a lot of women don't. There is like a lot of cutthroat behavior. There is a lot of like, I'm not here to make friends, I'm here to make money. Uh, it is a competition for a lot of women. So I think that's what makes it kind of hard. It's like, if you want to do something, it's very difficult. Um, another issue is like, cause I, I thought about that within my own club and other clubs, is that like, I have a fake persona at work. Like I'm not Nina and Megan, which is terrible. <laughs> Megan's kind of mean. Megan's not super nice, but it's kind of like you have to be tough in a situation, even if you're not, but they can still make it. And so it's like, yeah, it's like I think about like, oh, I'd like to do that. And then I'm like, oh, but like, how would that affect this sweet, tough personality I have going on? But I know there is a peep show in San Francisco that got unionized, but it's the only one. And it's just people working at that peep show. So it happened, San Francisco is like a whole weird world that I'm not sure exists. <laughs> <laughs> it's like literally just made by like Dan Savage to convince you that it'll get better. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think that's where we need to go, but I also think that you have to kind of get rid of stigma before women actually start caring about working together. And that's partially like legalization then? Yeah, yeah. legalization, sex education. I think creating support networks is a really good way, but I think actually trying to get women that are in sex work to get involved is going to be very difficult. Yeah. Because of kind of the attitude they have. I think that means yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad I came to my class today, by the way. So um, I wanted to know because I think it was so great to talk about, seriously, like to talk about your situation. I wanted to know, like, what pushed you? Um, so I don't really have anything to lose. I don't have like a, like, all my friends are like pretty weird. And <laughs> shout out to my friends that are here. Um, so they're, they don't have any issue with it. My family doesn't have any issue with it. And I really don't well, care. Well, that's, that's not quite true. Well, you still love me. Um, <laughs> 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 Yeah, like I said earlier, my self-esteem is really great, so I don't really care what other people think. And also, because
because I'm not dying. And I know people are. Like, I work with this girl who does heroin, and I love her, and she's very sweet, but the chances of her being dead in five years are huge. And she had white, and well, she was thin when she started, but like, these are terrible things that I'm watching people that I care about go through. And I think it's kind of like, yeah, this is terrifying for me, but it's so much worse for other people. Um, I guess I kind of just see it as that. It's like the right thing to do. Yes, Mom, please. I'll keep it short. Um, well, you are open, and it's a wonderful thing, but only in a certain environment. When when you're out in the public and not around people that you're comfortable with or that you know, and someone asks you, well, what do you do for, well, you, you have a job, what do you do? You don't openly say that, and, and there's a reason for it, um, whatever that reason is. But, I mean, we, aren't, we are not, as parents, comfortable with her situation just to be clear but we love her and we support her and I try to understand the way she looks at it is obviously different the way I, I looked at stripping growing up but anyway that I mean, no, I, I you are that. you can be open in certain in, in certain situations but obviously there are times when you can't be okay. yeah I mean I think that kind of goes with my sexuality as well it's pretty much a lot of aspects of my identity though like I don't come out to literally everyone um uh, my former partner that was a female, we drove down to Florida, and I remember talking to my mom about that. It's like, how affectionate to be in the South with my girlfriend. How safe was that going to be in certain places? So yeah, I mean, I think a lot of aspects of me as a human being are controversial. I think I'm really controversial in everything that I say. So I do try and limit that to where I'm going to stay safe. Um, but yeah, I'm talking about sex work at an LGBT conference. Like, it's pretty safe. It's pretty fine. Except that UMBC is in Baltimore. Everyone's pretty open. I'm also a gender and women's studies major, so talking about it in my classes is not super radical. Um, but yeah, so we do, I guess, have to. And um, here's a picture of me doing sports. <laughs> so, uh, it gets better than that. <laughs>